Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately being to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings, that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole, by his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sins of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. 
because of his affliction. He shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord.
let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your love. Be strong, let your heart take courage. All who hope in the Lord. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, He offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death.
The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold, and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have also taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, 
we will not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die, So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own? Or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priest and the guard saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, 
in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be in order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says they divided my garments among them and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over his spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. 
not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body, Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths, along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, and, and together with Father Chris Stubna, who is rector here at the cathedral, and, and on behalf of all of my brother priests and all the ministers uh, who are in the sanctuary today, I hope you feel the welcome mat. It's good to see so many of you uh, really taking um, some time out of your busy days to be here today uh, to reflect on one of the most important days in the history of humanity. And I hope you feel the welcome mat during the service and uh, want to indicate that uh, directly after our service is finished, my brother priests and I are going to be available for the sacrament of penance. And once again, that sacrament is a, is a demonstration, it's a visible sign of the welcome mat that Jesus offers to all of us. So I suspect that uh, all of you uh, are familiar with uh, that slogan, missing the forest for the trees. Missing the forest for the trees. And you know, what, what that means is that um, one is so focused on oneself that they only see the world revolving, revolving around them and, and not aware at all of what the big picture is. And I think that takes on some particular meaning, like there, there's a man who usually is, is on the sidewalk on South Craig, you know, the little tin can, and looking for some help. And I think um, that missing the forest for the trees can have us walking by him, looking at him, and just basically ignoring him and saying, that's his problem. Or maybe when we're driving and you're, we're eager to, to get where we need to go and we're kind of impatient with, with traffic being slowed down, we kind of cut off somebody else. They beep the horn and they say, get over it. That's your problem, huh? I think we can all identify with those kinds of experiences. But you know, as I was thinking about that slogan, I, I was wondering about just reversing it. Missing the trees for the forest. You know, as I take a look at my life, and I suspect that you may as well too, you know, uh, there are times in my life when, um, you know, I panic and say, where are my keys? And the whole time they're in my pocket, but I didn't know they were there. Or where's my cell phone? Looking all over the place and the cell phone's in my hand. You know, or my wallet, and I left it on the, the chest of drawers uh, in, in my bedroom. You know, and there are times uh, when uh, I'm so busy thinking about all the things that I have to do and you have to do as well too, 
that we miss some of the important things that we should take notice of. Lots of times, you know, I'm moving through and honestly don't see that somebody's there. And later they'll say, you ignored me. You're stuck on yourself. You didn't pay attention to me. And I think it's really important for us to make sure we take measures to not miss the trees for the forest. Many of you know that um, during the month of January, I um, availed myself of a, of a wonderful grace. I had the opportunity to make a 30-day silent retreat. It was a profound experience that truly has changed my life. And uh, usually in the third week of the retreat, and the retreat, all of the retreat is focused on, on the Gospels, but the third week of the retreat is focused on the passion and death of Jesus. And it was in the course of that retreat, and I would meet with my director every day. And this particular day, my director said, uh, do you realize how much you love Jesus? And I was shocked by his question. And I had to answer and say, no, I don't. And then he posed the other question, do you have any idea how much Jesus loves you? And I had to answer again, no, I don't. And so that particular day, I spent the rest of the day, and I spent 12 hours each day before the Blessed Sacrament, as I sat before the Lord, I came to look at the cross from a much different perspective. I went back to the 1950s when I was growing up as a kid, and, you know, I have to be grateful that my mom and dad took very seriously their passing on the faith to me. And I can still remember them showing me um, the crucifix in their bedroom, and they said, take a look at that cross. Take a look at Jesus hanging on that cross because you put him there, and we did too. And all of my education in the late 50s and the early 60s had the same message. Look at the cross. We put him there. And you know, in reality, there is truth to that. But in reality, that isn't the full picture. For so many years, 74 of them, to be honest with you, I had that particular perspective. I was missing the trees for the forest. And as I reflected on my retreat, I was helped by a very beautiful painting by an artist named James Tissot an artist of the 20th century. And his painting that really captured my attention and I hope yours to what we in fact commemorate here today was entitled, What Jesus Saw From the Cross. And in that painting, and if you have a chance to take a look at it, please do because you will see a multitude of people that Jesus looked at. Yes, his mother Mary. Yes, his best buddy John. Yes, Mary and some of his other lady friends. But lots of other people as well, too. Roman soldiers, you know, who in fact were looking for Jesus' death. The three kings who had come to Jesus' birth. Lots of bystanders. Herod, Pilate, all of these people were there. And as Jesus is looking down from the cross, he has one desperate hope that they will come to know someday the power of God's love for them and the dream that God had for them that they would in fact someday become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And guess what? That's where you and I come in. 
That's where we need to not miss the trees for the forest. Because when we commemorate today the death of Jesus, Jesus begs us when we look at the cross to look from his perspective as he looks down on us. And yes, you know, he's aware of the sins we've committed, the way we've gossiped, the way that we've lied, the way that we've cheated, the way that we've had unbridled passions, the way that we have done so many things that he would never do. But that is not what is primary in Jesus as he's looking at us. He knows the potential for every single one of us to become citizens of his Father's kingdom in heaven. And so when Jesus said from the cross, I thirst, what Jesus thirsts for is that we will not uh, miss the trees for the forest. That we will not miss his love profoundly for each and every single one of us. Very shortly, my sisters and brothers, we're going to have the very tender opportunity to come forward and to kiss the cross of Jesus. And as you come forward, Jesus begs you and me that our kiss may be full of meaning from our hearts and that when we come to kiss him, we can see what he sees, the potential for each of us to become citizens in his Father's kingdom. Pray, God. Pray, all of you, my sisters and brothers, that we may see the cross maybe in a different way than we've ever seen it. And let's especially pray that we may never miss the trees for the forest. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our Holy Father Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel.
let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for me, God's most unworthy servant, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for all your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that, reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for all of our sisters and brothers who believe in Christ that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered. Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Jewish sisters and brothers, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, Come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of all peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, comfort, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord.
on which is hung our salvation. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross on which is hung our salvation.
Our collection today for Good Friday is the annual collection that Pope Francis asked that we take up in support of the churches and shrines in the Holy Land. We're grateful for your generosity today. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the King, the power, and the May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring us to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy, be for us protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a reminder that all of the priests today will be hearing confessions immediately after our service. As a reminder, there is a station in the Joan of Arc Chapel in the very back. There are three confessionals to my left. One of the priests will be hearing confession in front of the St. Joseph altar, and Bishop Zubik will be on my right in the confessional on that side. The Lord be with you. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their own resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. 